Well, I suppose I suppose it's odd that this this novel is set in England because it's not. I haven't think set a novel in England since Jack Maggs. Um, as in the case of Jack Maggs, you know, it was essential that I do it. That you know, Jack Maggs had to come back to London. Perhaps it was not quite so essential in this case. In fact, I began trying to set it in many other places. Not quite this novel, but this idea, which is an idea really about the internal combustion engine, about oil, uh, about all this bright, bright invention that ends up being a sort of a poisonous invention. And so when you think like that, then you don't still know what the story is or who the people are or what's going to happen. And I began... Uh, or I don't know whether there's a first or second place I tried to set it was was, was in a, in a place in Gippsland in Australia where my father had sold Fords to farmers, T-model Fords. Um, that was interesting to me because it was in Australia, which after all was my territory, because it had some relationship with my family, uh, and we grew up talking about cars. Uh, we, 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 we spent our days, you know, I'd wake up to hear talk of cars and go to sleep to talk about cars. And my father was so in love with, the, with having grown up with the you know, technology of Ford and then later aeroplanes and so on. So I couldn't make that work. And, uh, and then I sort of went to Detroit or Dearborn, Michigan, where, where, and Henry Ford, and I needed some of course, some space aliens, aliens and, and various... I've been trying to write a book about aliens for a, a long, long time. I'm sort of half done at this time, but not really. And that didn't work. And as I was kept on looking for... I was really thinking about the Industrial Revolution or all those machines, you know, the lovely, lovely, lovely machines in which you, we go to a science museum and you see them and they're so, so beautiful and sort of quaint these days, but... Um, and I was thinking of the beauty of the invention and then the peril of the invention. And somehow, going around on the internet, I came across a, a mechanical duck invented by a Jacques Vaucanson in, in France in the late 18th century. Uh, I, I don't think I knew at the time that he was also quite a serious inventor and invented knitting machines and all sorts of things. But this wonderful duck with its imitation of life, uh, which also poses, of course, huge questions. I mean, if you make a machine and it's life and so on, then, then that's a big deal. So I thought, well, I'll have someone, it will be the duck instead of an engine somehow. And I think I had it in mind that the duck somehow would be like a wooden horse containing maybe the engine. Sort of crazy sort of way to think. And indeed, the person I give these sort of ideas to in the end of the book is the person who's, my characters in, in this book are, are not always mentally completely stable, but I did give this particular obsession, this notion about the automaton being the wooden horse uh, to the perhaps the least stable of my characters, a very clever young woman, uh, uh, an assistant to a museum conservator. So I had that, and then you have to start asking yourself why, you know, why, what? You know, so someone, I have someone going to have the duck made, which seems to me a really wonderful quest, and I think why will he be doing that? And the book, sort of Henry Brandling in the book, is really going to have the mechanical duck made because his son is ill with consumption, yes, but also really in a funny way because he's been driven out of the house by his wife who can't love the son because she's already lost a daughter to consumption and doesn't dare love him and the marriage has fallen apart. And in a way, he's been thrown out of his house and to hide his shame and to invent a quest for his son, he, he sets off to have this man. And then at the other end, I said, oh, what? I, I begin to invent this uh, museum conservator, Catherine. And I decide somewhere, and I can no longer really remember why. I can't sort of drag back from the muddy time, the battle of invention, uh, why, but uh, she has just lost her lover of 13 years, her secret lover. And uh, so she's in deep, deep, deep grief. It's the love of her life. And she cannot tell anyone at the museum where she works as a horologist, uh, someone concerned with the ticking and talking of clocks and clockwork, um, what is, what's really happened. And they all know the wife. And they don't know anything about the affair. 
and she's falling apart. And it turns out that there is one person who does know who her lover has confided to, and that's her boss, Crafty, Crofty, uh, Eric Croft. And he arranges for her to um, have something to take her mind off of grief, he hopes, uh, and, and it'll be the restoration of this automaton. They don't quite know exactly what it is. It's been in cardboard boxes since, uh, since the bombing of London, been evacuated quickly and rather shoddily. And part of her doing this particular job will involve her not working in the main museum, but working in an annex separated from everybody else. So her distressing and un untidy grief can be hidden from others. She's sort of nuts, uh, as we mostly tend to be in those situations. And so, and she hates, she loves clocks. Her father was a clockmaker, and she loves their precision and the peace that comes with their puzzles. But she doesn't really like automata, and they tend to creep her out. Like they creep most, out, really, this sort of imitation of life can be very unnerving and she relates times when you know she's she's had to work on a particular I think it's a monkey, a smoking monkey. She has had to work with a bag, put a bag over its head because it so distresses her. And so she ends up being sort of rather angry with her with her only friend uh, for giving her this task, which after all, she's a woman grieving and she has to uh, work on something that simulates life. Uh, so that's sort of how it sets off and how she finds, finally, uh, delving into these untidy boxes, the notebooks of Henry Brandling, uh, who so long ago, and I can, can't remember exactly the date, I think it's probably 1854, uh, has set off to the Black Forest in Germany to have what he hopes will be a duck, but which in the end will turn out to be so, a, a sort of more spectacular thing, a silver swan made for his son. And seeing this sort of slightly peculiar handwriting and being herself in a sort of a, 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 an unstable state, she decides that the writer of this, this, these notebooks who will describe how he came to search for the, the duck and then find the swan, uh, is himself sort of, I can't remember quite what it says. I mean, I think she, she recognises his pain. He's been driven mad. She knows he's a man, and her heart goes out to him straight away. In a way, all, all of her grief and emotions become displaced into these notebooks, which she will at certain stages be very unprofessional about, uh, steal from the museum, uh, without, you know, which would be very serious. And in one particular, particular case, throw this museum, museum object across a room so that it shatters in midair. So... That, in, within this, you have the you, you have the sort of the dynamic of the book. These two voices uh, across the years engaging with this object. And when I set out to write it, uh, I I thought I was doing an insane thing, which I guess I was. And then I have two characters who can never meet and can never know each other, and can't even have a sort of a woo woo sort of love affair. Um, and I really didn't know how I was going to solve it at all. Then I sort of found myself solving it sort of organically in the sense that they're both connected by their actions. Uh, both actions are, are concerned with the same physical object. And, and, and on the one hand, having it, commissioning it, and on the other hand, putting it together. And, and sometimes, as a result, with the, with the woman in 2010, uh, knowing more about the object than the man who's had it commissioned because the person who's making it for him uh, is a willful artist type uh, who won't tell his patron what he's doing. Uh, so sometimes she knows more than Henry.